we've never been this mismanaged before in the history of economics. It's all become political. Everything, the economy and politics is all downstream from culture. And we've dumbed ourselves down. The kids these days, they don't understand the Judeo-Christian tradition. They can't name a few significant philosophers or political philosophers or our founders or what's in the Constitution. The logic of a Madison who went to Princeton Seminary and wrote our Constitution is exactly the same as the logic of Adam Smith and economics. They both had atomized individuals and you wanted to separate power in every way, shape and form you could. And it's ironic that the left who's scared about tyrants and fascism wants to have a big state. How in the world, if you're scared about a fascist, do you want a big state? At the 2022 Conservative Political Action Conference in Dallas, Texas, I sat down with Dave Bratt, former congressman from Virginia. Bratt is now the dean of the business school at Liberty University. He also holds a Ph.D. in economics. Dave, it's good to see you again. Well, great to be on your show. I love it. I follow it regularly. <laughs> oh, thank you. Are you surprised the Democrats are planning a new spending bill, even as inflation is the number one concern for Americans? Yeah, I wish I were surprised. I'm not. They, uh, they constantly focus on stimulus and the demand side of the economy for political reasons, uh, not for economic reasons. So with the elections coming up, no one wants to be, you know, uh, on the deck of the Titanic uh, when, when musical chairs stop, right? And they know uh, we, we have a, uh, it's called the everything bubble now. It, it's, it's like 07, 08 with the financial crisis, but even bigger. And everyone pays attention to the financial side of the economy, which is the stock market and all that. Uh, but no one, no one pays attention to the real economy, right, which is, you know, investing in capital and then jobs and human capital and total factor productivity, uh, which is now at zero. And the expert in the world there is at Northwestern University, Robert Gordon. At 40 years work, he's undisputed head of productivity studies. And uh, we're now at zero. Same with Europe. After the war, Europe came out strong, rebuilding, and they're now down to zero total factor productivity, and so are we. Why? And, uh, because we don't focus on innovation and entrepreneurship and uh, build skills in the kids in K-12 education. Uh, we're teaching them about pronouns and uh, ideology instead of getting them job skills. The Chinese and the Indians don't do any of this, right? They're, they know full well. They focus on math and STEM and uh, engineering and IT and computer science. And uh, they're, they're still chugging away where we, our real economy has been anemic. And so now we're in a recession. We've had two quarters of shrinking economy, right, negative growth for six months. And the, uh, the Fed has tried to pop it up with a sugar high, right? They printed $8 trillion on the balance sheet of the Fed. And then we were $30 trillion in debt on the government side, trying to stimulate this dead economy, but just trying to keep the blood flowing. And uh, now we're running into the home stretch and we're at zero growth heading into an election. So the, the Dems are throwing some money at the, you know, the green stuff and... Uh, it doesn't really matter. They just want to throw any money they can, another $500 billion, but it's misallocated. So you think that Congress are more worried about a slowing economy than they are yeah. about inflation? Yeah. I mean, they're, uh, no, they're more worried about their own election cycle. <laughs> so, but the secondary effect is, yeah, they don't, they don't want the economy slowing down and having a massive recession on their watch. Like yesterday, there was a fun news report. New Jersey is still trying to fix, they have so much money rolling in from COVID payments still, they don't know what to do with it all, right? So the stimulus is still flowing out there, right? That money is still going through the pipeline. And uh, that probably comes to an end in another month or two, totally to an end. And then you'll get a clear look at the real economy, right? The underlying, how is the engine running? That's the economy, right? Producing cars and refrigerators. Real estate's already taking a nosedive because of the mortgage rate. So that's clear. And, uh, you know, famous guys, uh, Schiller, that won the Nobel Prize for finance, the Schiller Index and all that. He, he wrote papers 10 years ago, 07, 08, uh, titled The Housing is the Business Cycle. Right. So when housing takes a dive, there's a lot of consumer goods that follow. If you don't buy a house, you don't do the refrigerator and the washer and dryer and you don't hire as many plumbers and all that kind of stuff. So it's coming. You know, and I'm not just saying it because it's dire, but every the Wall Street guys all know the market's still got a long way to go down. So how bad does the recession get? 
Um, I think it's going to be, it's not a soft landing, right? That's a mild recession where you just kind of go down a little bit and come out of it. And so a lot of it is contingent on how we manage it. Uh, this spending bill uh, will help you and help the stock market in the short run, uh, but it hurts us uh, in the long run. And it, that's, that's a distinction no one pays attention to, right? <clears throat> so the Fed constructed, and the real interest rate has been coming down for 50 years straight. The Federal Reserve has constructed that policy. And you can go out and look that up. I right? just got to FRED, which is the Federal Reserve database, and just type in real interest rate, and it's just down. And so we had a 0% interest rate for 10 years. Well, who's that good for? That's good for the stock market. So a lot of money, it has to go somewhere. So it pumps into stocks and bonds and equities and real estate and everywhere. So that's all up. Uh, but it didn't do uh, our grandmas and grandpas and their retirement accounts any good uh, when the interest rate at banks is 0%. So it hurt the middle class. And I'm shocked, right, after 07, 08, no one went to jail after just horrendous behavior in the private sector and by the Fed. And so Wall Street calls this the Greenspan put, that whenever it gets really bad, the Fed will come in to bail out Wall Street. And so they know they got the, the Greenspan put to protect them and the financial interests. Uh, but you out there, uh, you don't have the Fed coming to your rescue, right? When your small business goes under, no one comes in with a Greenspan put to protect you. And so uh, there's, there's surveys out right now. Everyone go Google them, right? But the, uh, there's surveys right now that show about 50% of small businesses uh, don't know if they can pay the bills uh, next month, right? And for sure within six months. Some, are, some say, half of them say, we may be bankrupt within six months half of the small businesses uh, so that's what's coming down the pike and uh, we've never been here right we've never been this mismanaged before in the history of economics that I've ever it's all become political uh, and it, it looks like kind of third world nations where you know uh, thugs and tyrants and their uncles and families uh, are paid off to keep power intact and we've kind of given up on the price system as a way of managing our economy. This is what you're seeing. You're seeing a yeah. certain, you, you mentioned Wall Street. This yeah. is what you mean. Some yeah. some industries, some people are getting paid yeah. off. Yeah. And the other sectors of the economy are yeah. suffering for it. Yeah. And the last time on your show, I mean, our big five tech firms, right? Apple and Google and Twitter and Facebook and Microsoft. Those five firms are worth more than all European firms combined. Not English, not French, all European, right? And so the first thing, when you have a market economy, you have to have a market. You have to have a lot of firms on the supply curve and a lot of people on demand, and then you get competition, and that results in great product variety and low prices. Right now, we got five monopoly positions, and they run the government. I mean, they can, they can cut off anyone on uh, social media anytime they want that expresses political views they don't want. I think everybody knows that now. And uh, so we got a CIA and an FBI and a Justice Department that are uh, highly in dispute. And so uh, we're going through some mechanics and uh, I think there's a political realignment. This isn't Republican versus Democrat anymore. Right now there's gonna be a middle class revolt. Uh, Republicans and Democrats, uh, African American, Hispanics are all unifying into kind of a populist movement that says, uh, I trust the first hundred people in the phone book more than I trust you guys in D.C. And I think they're going to express their will over the next uh, election cycles. There's a lot to unpack there. On the big tech firms, do you support antitrust for breaking oh, yeah. up these oh, firms? Sure. You do. Yeah. There's some libertarians, some conservatives that don't want to go there. Yeah, well, they're because uh, a lot of those libertarians are getting checks from the big tech firms, <laughs> <laughs> number one. And I'm friends with all those libertarians. And I have strong libertarian tendencies. And I tell all my liberty, libertarian friends, it's nice you guys showed up in 1900 after, and I'm Protestant, after the Catholic Church, you know, kept the text alive for, you know, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages yeah. and uh, set up Magna Carta and constitutional government, Republican government, democracy and human rights language. And, uh, and then a Presbyterian economist named Adam Smith came along and set up free markets based upon the rule of law, constitutional government, uh, contracts and you guys come along in 1900 and say I'm in favor of liberty well no kidding so am I uh, but there's some gratitude that needs to be expressed over 2,000 years and uh, 
so part of that uh, contractual government setup for free markets to work is you have to have markets working. And in order to have that, you cannot have monopolies and a concentration of power economically or especially so much power that it's, it can threaten your government, the, the republic itself. And I think we're at, at, at about that point. So how would that look? How would antitrust against these firms look? They just break them. I think, I mean, for me, you should at least have, you know, I mean, five firms. There should be a market cap, 20% uh, ownership by sector, so you can't ever have more than 20% market share, something really? like this. Really? So you ensure competition. And this is nothing radical. Every economist wants working markets. Really? We'll go back to government spending again. When, yep. when you were in Congress back as, yep. as, as recently as 2019, yep. like, how did people talk about government spending there? Was there yep. any talk about how it would affect the American people? No. No, I ran on it. And uh, it was like I was yelling at the sky, you know. I mean, it, 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 I, was, I was naming off all the numbers I named earlier, and uh, no one cared because it doesn't affect them immediately, right? And so, but that's new, right? We used to be disciplined, right? You had the American work ethic, the Protestant work ethic, Max Weber, all this famous stuff, and people saved, and uh, it, it was virtuous to save, and that that savings produced a capital base. And uh, like in China, I mean, they had a you know 40% savings rate, and they grew like crazy. Well, we had that too originally, uh, but now we're all watching the Kardashian family and blowing cash on Gucci purses and all this kind of thing, and it's it's run amok. You think it's coming from the culture? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Everything's the economy and politics is all downstream from culture, and we've dumbed ourselves down. Uh, the kids these days, uh, you know, liberty is kind of an exception, but they don't they don't understand the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, they don't uh, they can't name a, a few significant philosophers or political philosophers or our founders or what's in the Constitution. And uh, the West, right? When you mention the West, it's basically this synthesis between the Judeo-Christian religious tradition and the Greeks, reason, human reason, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. And that combination has, has served us very well as a civilization for thousands of years. And uh, right now, no one even knows what it is. Well, tell me about proper economics from a Judeo-Christian perspective. Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it's the same as uh, what I was just sketching out. The, uh, the, the guts of the Judeo-Christian system starts in, uh, it didn't take long for humanity to do a belly flop, right? So the fall of humanity takes Genesis 3 is the fall, right? So human nature, Adam and Eve eat the apple, rebellion from God. And uh, so in our tradition, human nature is not good. And this is the Catholics, the Jewish tradition. Every smart person, uh, you know, this includes the Aristotle and Plato, not Christians. Every great political thinker, Hobbes, Leviathan, what's that about, right? Human nature is corrupt. Everybody's known this, uh, with two exceptions. Rousseau, who was a, a great, smart liberal, he was wrong, uh, and he was utopian, so it led to the French Revolution, that kind of thing. Uh, but a Christian uh, economics and politics, it, that's the great split between uh, conservatives and liberals, is your view of human nature. And so conservatives, the logic of a, uh, of a Madison, who went to Princeton Seminary and wrote our Constitution, is exactly the same as the logic of Adam Smith and economics. Uh, they both had atomized individuals, and you wanted to separate power in every way, shape, and form you could, right? So our federal government separated by three branches of government, and then you have the federal and the state and the local all separated, and then within all those you have separations, but now we've unified all power in the executive branch underneath the presidency. Uh, the politicians are too scared to say anything, uh, the Supreme Court uh, has been taken over by executive orders uh, that are completely unconstitutional. And so the founders and, and the Christian theorists would just be horrified, right? We've, uh, we've unified all power again. <clears throat> and uh, Plato in the Republic, right, there were kind of five regimes. And uh, democracy was the, the worst, except for what comes after it. And if you let democracy, right, the rule of all by all with no morality and no hierarchy of virtues leads to chaos because you have no order, no moral order, and out of chaos comes the tyrant. And uh, if we don't get our ducks in a row soon, that's the left talks about this, right? Uh, and it, it, it's ironic that the left, who's scared about tyrants and the fascism, uh, wants to have a big state. How in the world, if you're scared about a fascist, do you want a big state? 
right? I mean, Germany comes to mind and Italy and whatever, right? And so it's, uh, we, that's what I'm saying. Uh, no one knows the basics anymore. Yeah. So if we're talking about a, an economy focused on the individual, I yeah. assume low taxes, right? Oh, sure. Low oh, regulations. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I suppose allowing people to keep what they've earned by not yeah. inflating it away, all yeah. of which were, were going the opposite way. Oh, yeah. And that, that, I mean, that, I don't even care on that, right? If you take care of the federal government and you want to have a luxurious state government or local government and plant flowers on every corner and the people vote on this, with, and you can vote at your feet with a local, right? If you want to have flowers all over and do crazy spending and the people vote for tax increases at the local level, I'm exaggerating a little here. But I have less problem with that because it's not a threat to the republic. Right, but then yeah, all the all the natural uh, stuff kicks in. We're we're focused. I started off. We're focused on the demand side of the economy. On spent the Federal Reserve when they print money, that's to enhance demand. When we go, when the federal government goes into 30 trillion in debt, that's to enhance demand. Everyone is ignoring the economy itself is yeah. supply, yeah. which is business, and there, so you have to incentivize business and production. And we're, no one will talk about that because they're the bad guys, they're the capitalists, right? So the Marxists have kind of won the ideological war. Marx's ethical theory was about as deep as a wading pool, right? His moral theory was people without capital are morally good and people with capital are bad. They're called capitalists. And serious, this was his, he saw Rousseau couldn't explain why human nature went bad. And Marx followed Rousseau and said, I can. The bad guys own capital. And back then, just to, enhance the humor of the statement back then capital was like a plow for your horse and a shovel <laughs> right so the owners of capital I mean there were there there was the beginning of the capitalism back 1850 but uh, it's an absurd it's not a moral theory and no one even acts like Marx has a moral theory because he doesn't but he won the ideological war the rich guys are the bad guys and it's interesting because I used to take that on full-throated, but now you hear I'm getting a little nuanced because some of the capitalists uh, aren't adhering to the basic rules of the game. And uh, the same thing is true in like China uh, currently, and y you can see what that does to uh, the treatment of 1.4 billion people made in the image of God, right? And they're not being treated well there, and if you want that here, Okay, you see what's coming. Who speaks the most economic sense in Congress today? Uh, unfortunately, not many, even my buddies, are out there, and they should be, right? That's the I mean, Congress is all kind of about bills. They talk about the next bill, and bills are kind of incremental because we set up, the founders set it up to be slow moving. So that's a good, in a way, it's kind of a good thing. <clears throat> uh, but th there's not many guys uh, leading the day talking about, they'll talk about the issue of the day, that's economics. Some of them are doing that, and it, 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 you guys, you follow the whole world. I, I was shocked when I was in Congress, there was no talk of foreign relations, China, Russia, any of it, right? A, one little committee with a couple guys would kind of run it, and uh, they don't have that much influence either, but you kind of just left it all to the White House, and if the White House is compromised in any way, shape, or form by any foreign entity, well, you're in some trouble because we're supposed to be three co-equal branches of government running things. And so we've kind of been derelict in our duties. So we need to get back at it. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why Why was there no talk about um, overseas? And even China was always, yeah. did you, when did you notice China was a threat? Well, I was late to the game too. I'm kind of mad at myself, right? Not not early enough. I was, I was always kind of hopeful that countries that trade together wouldn't go to war together. I kind of had that probably, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and I was hopeful. But then, I mean, but at the same time, the Judeo-Christian moral piece comes in, the golden rule. It's not just Judeo-Christian. Most religious uh, systems have that embedded. And so that just suggests simple reciprocity. Now that I would have always, right, like how in the world do we allow China to have access to everything across our systems? Hollywood, patents, science, higher education, every capital markets. Uh, without being vetted. I don't know if the American people know any of that. And they don't allow us access to any of what I just named. Right now that, I mean, is just irrational, right? So that, I, I know simple kind of things, uh, but I, uh, I, I became a war of documents like unrestricted warfare written by the Chinese colonels who are now generals 
and uh, that that document will wake you up. 1999. You can Google it. It's all uh, out there uh, online. Unrestricted warfare. Yeah. Go as a first step. Go read that thing. Back to the the Congress again, and, and the bills that are passed, et cetera, the spending bills. How much influence do lobbyists and special interests have in crafting these and pushing these bills? Yeah, you're you're going to get me in trouble on this one because this is my hot button right now. I've I've got a uh, great candidate running for my old seat, and I just tell you this is an example. And uh, she's running for Congress, and. Uh, She's been told that she doesn't back the speaker, uh, she won't get five to ten million dollars. So this is not the sign of a democracy, right? This is the sign of what I was saying, a third world uh, run type government where you either follow the fearless leader and you get money or you don't, right? It's like uh, giving your uncle the bananas down in a uh, South American country. Here, you get this sector, you get this sector. Right? So this is very scary and this is on the Democrat side even. They're, they're, they, they're tough as nails. They never depart. Right, but I was that way too. If I wouldn't vote for like the the health care bill because I promised I was going to repeal Obamacare because I don't want 20% of the economy being run by the federal government. It's my principles. I just told you why they're my principles. And uh, so this person will do the same and uh, make that commitment, and she'll get no campaign money. I got zero campaign money from the conservative party because I was being conservative. And when I ran against Cantor, who was going to be the speaker, I ran on the Republican creed. Uh, kind of ironically to have a little humor in there. I said there's nothing wrong with the Republican creed. The only problem is no one follows it. And that creed has all the principles I suggested. Strong moral fiber, constitutional adherence, a free market system is the best provider of goods and services, these things. So they all run on it and say it, uh, but no one's doing it. And so, yeah, how, how important is money and special interests? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's running the day, right? And it's also running our relationships with China, uh, our, our CEO class is literally selling out the country to make money, just gasping for the last bit of profits because it's all going to collapse now, right? Explain that to me. Well, they, you know, in the past, I mean, uh, we're growing, the U.S. is a $20 trillion economy growing at 2%. China was a $20 trillion economy growing at 10%. So, I mean, guess where the growth is, right? So all our firms were just wham, and, you know, going over, and then, you know, in finance, 101, a freshman in college, the first lesson you learn is diversification. Don't put all your eggs in the basket. Well, all the Harvard MBAs, all the geniuses that got 1,600 test scores, uh, guess what they did? They put all the eggs, all the pharmaceuticals, all the chips, all the everything in one country. <laughs> Taiwan, Taiwan, whatever, Ch uh, China. I, it's just <clears throat> incredible what we've done in order to save a nickel but they didn't look at, you know, geopolitical threats weren't in their calculations. And so now, uh, we're not at war yet, uh, but you've got, you know, the China news about economic difficulties they're having with the real estate sector. Uh, the people, 70% uh, of their assets are held uh, through real estate. 30% of the Chinese economy is real estate. Uh, and they're having protests in the streets. China rolled out a tank the other day. And so if you're, uh, if a huge bet uh, position of yours is in China right now, and you're not kind of finding alternative supply chains, oh boy. And so not only is that not the case, I mean, people are, st we're still providing chips uh, related to the defense industry. Korea's still doing it, Taiwan's still doing it, we're still doing it to China. Uh, when, as I say, there's documents now, and I think they shot a couple missiles over uh, Taiwan this morning, or threatened to do so at least. They did. And so, uh, you know, I mean, if you're a corporate CEO looking out uh, for the best interest of your shareholders, and you're not taking this into account, I mean, it, that then then greed has taken over 100 percent. Do you feel that over the past 50 years, that how much, like you described, the U.S. has built up the Chinese Communist Party? Yeah. Has it been yeah. purely for economic reasons, or have there been people who are sympathetic to the socialist cause who have also perhaps wanted to see this happen? Yeah, I think the latter part's more recent. Uh, in in the past, you know, the, we set up after World War II, we made friends with our arch enemies. That's a nice uh, Judeo-Christian kind of thing to do, right? Uh, we bond. We said, hey, it uh, might be nicer if you had a constitution. We set up the Bretton Woods Global Order, the World Bank, the IMF, United Nations, and it worked, right? 
Uh, and so we provided protection for the world's trading order. That's a first in human history. We provided free shipping without risk for everybody. And that every, we, the, the trade blew up growth, right? And so China saw that, took advantage of that, and then they started taking advantage of everything else under the sun. And uh, we saw it, but that's when the self-interest kicked in too much from our uh, private sector guys who fund the political guys. So they're all in on this game together. And then the progressives uh, have become extremely leftist now, right? Uh, the, the liberals, the old John Stuart Mill Bentham liberals have turned into Frankfurt School Marxists, for real. And I was in academia for 30 years, so I know. I mean, this I'm not exaggerating. And uh, those folks, their view of human nature is Rousseauian, like I said, utopian. And if that's the case, uh, they think that the U.S. is a detriment to global progress. We just set up what I just described, the Bretton Woods liberal order for the rest of the world, and the whole world got rich. Chinese and the Indians were making $1,000 a year. Now they're, make, they're, they're in total poverty, right? Two and a half billion people. And now two and a half billion people are doing pretty well. And so the U.S. did incredibly good things for the world. And instead of getting thanks uh, from the CCP, not the Chinese people, right, but the CCP and the oligarchs around the world, I mean, it's just a moral void of nihilism or worse than nihilism, evil, right? And uh, if you don't know what evil is, go read Dante's Inferno or something. <laughs> right? It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think it goes without saying that this idea of even the free markets couldn't yeah. change the Chinese Communist Party no. in the end. Right, right. And that, that's interesting, right? And so Russia, the Soviet Union kind of goofed up and they liberalized the politics, glasnost, and not the economics as fast. And then China did the opposite. They liberalized the economics to grow, but kept a iron fist on the politics. And that has served them well for, you know, GDP growth on average. Uh, but, you know, it depends on how you view human autonomy and people made in the image of God. Do you treat individuals like that, that even if you can generate income? Can you treat people that way? I, I don't think so. Mm. Let's wait and see. Yeah. Dave wait. Bratt, Liberty University. Appreciate yeah. it, Dave. No, appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, guys. You guys do a great job.